following is a review of plasma physicist and philosopher Timothy Eastman's book, Untying the Gordian Knot, Process, Reality, and Context. It was published in 2020. It was nearly a century ago, in the midst of the, in the, midst of the quantum and relativistic revolutions in physics, that Whitehead realized scientific progress had reached a turning point. Quote, The old foundations of scientific thought are becoming unintelligible. What is the sense of talking about a mechanical explanation when you do not know what you mean by mechanics? If science is not to degenerate into a medley of ad hoc hypotheses, it must become philosophical and must enter upon a thorough criticism of its own foundations. End quote. Despite Whitehead's warning, the 1920s also saw the rise of a positivist prohibition on speculative metaphysics, handicapping progress into the foundations of post-classical science and producing precisely the fragmented medley that he feared. Fortunately, a growing chorus of interdisciplinary scientists is taking up the philosophical work left unfinished by the early 20th century founders of quantum theory. In Untying the Gordian Knot, plasma physicist cum philosopher Timothy Eastman adds his voice to the ensemble, offering his Logoi framework as a meta-theory that aims not only to make ontological sense of quantum mechanics, but to integrate it with several other emerging 21st century frameworks, including complex system science, Persian triadic semiotics, and category theory. This alone would make Eastman's book worthy of careful study, but he goes even further, sketching the plan for a bridge between science, or the way of numbers, and the human ethical and spiritual spheres, the ways of context. Despite the grand scope of his inquiry, Eastman remains humble and conciliatory. His Logoi framework is not post-anything, but a proto-worldview, as he puts it, that seeks to balance both theory and story, both systematic rigor and open-ended adventure. Eastman's masterful synthesis of dozens of cutting-edge researchers across numerous disciplines is impossible to summarize in this short review. Thus, in what follows, I focus on a few of Untying the Gordian Knot's important contributions to the birth of a process relational science. We could also call it uh, an organic science. Eastman decided to study physics and philosophy not only because he wanted to understand the physical world, but, but because from a young age he intuited that this wondrous whole, as he calls it, contains layers of meaning deeper than the merely measurable. Natural science has allowed human beings to reach beyond the mundane proportions of their sense organs and species-specific umwelt toward extreme magnitudes of space and time. Telescopes extend our eyesight across vast distances of intergalactic space. Microscopes into the nuclei of cells and even atoms Inferences from radioactive decay rates of certain isotopes allow us to infer the age of fossils millions or billions of years into the past. Such techniques have dramatically expanded our understanding of the universe and our place within it. But in, the extending, uh, but in extending our senses to scales they were not evolved to perceive, often while using empirical concepts derived from human-scale perception, we run the risk of succumbing to the sort of model-centric literalism that imagines we possess an outside God's-eye view of an already-finished universe. Eastman seeks to re-embed the scientific perspective within the evolving universe 
that gave rise to it, such that, quote, the most fundamental notions of natural science can be inferred from normal human experience. This follows from Eastman's commitment to the Whiteheadian ideal that, uh, as Randall Oxia and Gary Hurstein put it, concrete experience, concrete existence rather, explains the abstract aspects of experience and not vice versa. Concrete existence explains the abstract aspects of experience and not vice versa. Uh, Oxia and Hurstein describe this in their book, The Quantum of Explanation, Whitehead's Radical Empiricism. Eastman carefully deconstructs the conceptual impediments to philosophical integration of post-classical science, such as uh, what he refers to as actualism, um, nominalism, and determinism, arguing that potentials or potentia in his terms have a creative role to play that both upsets notions of efficient causal closure and reintroduces formal causes into our accounts of natural processes. While quantum physics has forced the issue, Eastman points out that it is misleading to construe even the formalisms of classical Newtonian physics as though they entail strict determinism, since all such modeling frameworks make assumptions about initial and boundary conditions, relevant scales, and domains for meaningful solution, granting potentia real participation in the physical world not only allows science to consider the anticipatory capacities and creative agency of biological organisms in a non-reductive way, it also resolves long-standing quantum puzzles which resulted from trying to force-fit a classical mechanistic ontology to results that should indicate the need for a new process relational ontology. Building on the relational reality model of Epperson and Zephyrus in their 2013 book, Eastman describes the evolution of quantum events from pure potential to probabilities to actualization when measured a process involving both logical conditioning and causal reiteration. Integrating Ruth Kastner's transactional interpretation of quantum mechanics, Eastman argues that acts of measurement are not passive observations of already existing facts, but rather themselves establish new facts. There can be no ultimate causal closure, either for finite systems or for the universe as a whole, since the ontological unrest of newly emerging facts breaks any such closure. The universe thus becomes a cumulative succession of actual occasions of experience, wherein potentia grow together with actualities by linking local causal interactions with global logical constraints in the ongoing process of realization. This process is asymmetric and includes both a standard Boolean dyadic logic of actualizations in what we, uh, what Eastman calls res extense, and a triadic logic of potentialities, or of what Eastman calls res potentiae. Eastman argues that, quote, dyadic relations do not in fact exist in the real world, only in the world of abstract modeling. End quote. This is because context is inevitably involved and because the relationship between potentiality and actuality is inherently asymmetrical, from whence comes the arrow of time. Eastman's Logoi framework, again following Epperson and Zephyrus, thus carries forward Whitehead's crucial distinction in process and reality between the logical order of concrete events what he called genetic division, and the causal order of metrical space-time, what he called coordinate division. The former, rooted in fundamental quantum processes, is given primacy, while the latter, rather than being conceived of as a pre-existing continuum serving as a container for processes, 
is secondarily emergent from such processes. In Eastman's words, quote, Quantum physics exemplifies the fact that physical extensiveness or standard space-time description is fundamentally topological rather than metrical, with its proper logico-mathematical framework being category-theoretic, that is, relations of relations, rather than set-theoretic, uh, that is, sets of things, end quote. Grasping the significance of Eastman's Logoi framework may be aided by contrasting it with popular actualist accounts. Eastman critiques the physical theory of everything, articulated by Sean Carroll in his book The Big Picture, on the origins of life, meaning, and the universe itself, uh, 2016. Carroll takes up the God's eye perspective by offering a single, what he calls, core theory, an equation combining quantum mechanics, space-time, gravity, matter, the Higgs field, and other forces, which he, claim, which he claims leaves no room for new aspects of the universe that are not already well understood. Eastman points out that while the components of this core equation represent great achievements, in practice, no one has ever succeeded in combining them into a practical model or simulation. Carroll's core theory thus amounts to no more than a mashup, and is not anywhere close to being a working equation. On Eastman's reading, Carroll makes several unstated metaphysical assumptions, including actualism, physicalism, and causal closure, leading him to mistake an amalgam of dyadic input-output models, as though they could serve as an ultimate explanation for the universe. Rather than accepting uh, Carroll's actualist rendering of the Feynman path integral formulation of quantum physics, where electrons are assumed to take every path, with the largest probability being given to that path which approaches classical physics, rather than accepting Carroll's uh, rendering of this, Eastman argues that, quote, physical relations emerge from the multiple sampling of potentia pre-space, which is operationally handled by the principle of least action, reflecting optimization of relations of relations in this pre-space, end quote. Rather than prematurely limiting our creative cosmos to the idealized deductivist models of current physics, or suggesting untestable scientific exotica like the vast ontological overflow of actualized possible worlds, as in the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, Eastman leaves open the possibility of genuinely novel emergence within the only universe we could ever know anything about. Whitehead's cosmology, along with Peirce's and contemporary physicist Lee Smolin's ideas, are often interpreted as implying that physical law is more a matter of empirical probability rather than being metaphysically grounded. Since deism no longer, uh, is no longer a live option for scientists, as it was in Descartes' and Newton's day, very few have attempted to ground law metaphysically. The closest thing contemporary physics has to such a metaphysical ground for physical laws are symmetry principles, but, but from Eastman's perspective, these principles remained, remain groundlessly circular descriptions without an accompanying process relational ontology. Peirce attempted to reformulate laws as habits, but Eastman worries this may be a category error that, despite Peirce's realist intentions, falls prey to nominalism. For Eastman, genuine habits can only be said to emerge at the biological level. Without wanting to affirm deductivism, he nonetheless thinks necessity must have some purchase in nature for many of the findings of modern physics to make any sense. He thus argues that nature's laws derive not from any deductive necessity, but rather from the conditional contingency of trajectory-optimizing histories. For example, the principle of least action. He compares these trajectories to what Leibniz 
referred to as striving possibles. In addition to its paradigm remaking implications for physics, Eastman's Logoi framework makes a fundamental distinction between the Boolean domain of actualized measurements and the non-Boolean domain of pre-space potentia, which has important implications for the study of human consciousness. Rather than reducing our concrete experience of mental processing to abstract correlations among measurable brain states, the Logoi framework allows us to take seriously our sense of being conscious agents capable of some degree of decisive influence over the ongoing flux of reality. With the inclusion of the realm of potentia into physical ontology, human consciousness, human consciousness need no longer be thought of as an anomalous intruder into an otherwise well-behaved mechanical universe. Instead, our conscious experience offers us an intimate window into the function of potentia in the broader course of nature. As our, every, our everyday mental capacities involve uh, tapping into and expressing ontologically genuine remainders of real possibility, as Eastman puts it. It follows that popular claims on behalf of artificial intelligence systems said to be on the verge of realizing effectively human levels of consciousness and cognition are rooted in faulty metaphysical presuppositions. AI systems are entailment devices limited to input-output that is Boolean logic alone, and so cannot tap into the realm of potentia in the way biologically evolved, historically emergent minds can. Eastman synthesizes important insights from a variety of researchers to contribute much-needed clarity to the scientific understanding of the role of emergence in nature. Emergent physical entities are so described because as novel wholes, they are not derivable either from the stuff of which they are made, nor from the laws of physics. Eastman distinguishes emergence as a synchronic hierarchical process that builds on diachronic causation. Many basic causal and emergent processes are rooted in multi-scale quantum field processes. Eastman gives the example of space plasmas, whose emergent processes range from planetary to galactic scales. Emergence is thus not merely a matter of epistemic limits to reductive explanations, but rather a consequence of the influence of quantum process across all physical scales. In the Logoi framework, causation is interpreted more broadly than just the dyadic correlation of facts typically uh, typical of actualist frameworks. From within an actualist framework, any novelty or emergence can only be regarded as an epiphenomenon arising from random error or chance. Understanding emergent entities and processes requires symbolic bridges, as knowledge presupposes a distinction between knower and known, and thus the need for mediation. Eastman proposes Whiteheadian prehension as one such symbolic conceptual bridge. Eastman shares Charles Hartshorn's sense that prehension is the most powerful metaphysical generalization ever accomplished, as it allows all sorts of relations, for example, memory, perception, causality, spatial, temporal, subject, object, God, world, etc., to be accounted for in terms of one generic type. Further, the metaphysics of prehension imply that all physical relations are fundamentally asymmetrical in structure. Prehension can be variously understood as a philosophical embodiment of field theory, as the ontologization of the mathematical function, as, uh, and as an account of quantum process. In light of Whitehead's prehensional account of causation and emergence and Epperson and Zephyrus's applications, Eastman argues that a strong case can be made for the idea that all macro systems, including relativistic spacetime, 
are ontologically emergent from fundamental quantum processes. Although, East, although Eastman creatively expands upon Whitehead's process philosophy, he does so without remaining unduly tied to the latter's categorical scheme. He emphasizes Lehman McHenry, McHenry's interpretation of Whiteheadian prehensions as, quote, concrete functions rather than abstract relations, thus contrasting Whitehead's third approach to his former collaborator Bertrand Russell's nominalistic logical atomism. Prehension is defined in its physical mode as, uh, by McHenry, quote, the present occasion's absorption of past actual occasions in its process of self-creation. This leaves out the role of conceptual prehensions in Whitehead's scheme, that is, the present occasion's ingression of potentials or eternal objects in its process of self-creation. McHenry appears to question the need for Whitehead's eternal objects, at least if they are given a platonic emphasis. Eastman claims his account of a diachronic process in terms of pre-space potentia plays a role similar to that of Whitehead's prehensive unification, first introduced in Science and the Modern World and published in 1925. Despite approving of Whitehead's perspectival account of the relation between universals and particulars, Eastman sometimes indicates a desire to distance himself from Whitehead's eternal objects, thus implying that there may be important differences between his landscapes of potentia and the realm of eternal objects. This is a fertile area for further philosophical exploration beyond the scope of this brief review. Nonetheless, a few suggestions can be offered. One way of beginning such an exploration stems from asking whether the choice of realism over nominalism as regards the status of form in nature entails Platonism. Eastman thinks not, but given that Plato wrote dialogues and not doctrines, it all depends what is meant by Platonism. Regardless of the nature of his divergence from Whitehead's category of eternal objects, they clearly share a rejection of nominalism. Eastman puts forward an argument against nominalist actualism that is rooted in quantum potentia that integrate local global interactions without themselves having any specific space-time location. They are generals in C.S. Peirce's sense, serving as logical constraints on physical processes. From Eastman's point of view, admitting potentia back into nature is far more parsimonious than the actualist, nominalist interpretations of quantum theory, for example, the many worlds and multiverse hypotheses. Eastman concludes his book with an attempt to link human and cosmic logoi in search of some sense of the deeper meaning of our existence. Careful to avoid any monological fixations, he builds on George Ellis's canonic morality, wherein human values like truth, goodness, and beauty, quote, reflect the forces or intentions that created the universe as part of the deep structure of the cosmos, in Ellis's terms. Eastman also amplifies Robert Neville's worry about the, quote, enormous damage to human civilization resulting from the loss of value reference and realistic valuation in modern Western science. With characteristic caution and modesty, Eastman seeks to contrast his own Logoi framework, which aims at evidence-based methodolo methodology, with the advocacy-based thinking that is more appropriate in cultural and political spheres. In the final pages, Eastman honors the Dakota peoples upon whose land he first had the spiritual experience that initiated his inquiry into the nature of reality. Quote, In confronting the psychological challenges of nihilism, denialism, and assorted despairs of contemporary life, in facing up to the physical threats of war, 
pandemics, human suffering, and in newly realizing the deteriorating of Earth's climate, ecology, and habitability, can we somehow embrace what we have learned through science and philosophy and what we may yet draw on from indigenous and other spiritualities, so as to bring into being a world in which we humans can live and flourish over the long term? Eastman has succeeded in making a major contribution toward such an integral embrace. <laughs>